It gives me great pleasure to introduce the Kavli Prize winner in nanoscience for 2012, Professor Mildred Dresselhaus from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, the prize is awarded her for uh, her pioneering contributions to the study of phonons, electron phonon interactions, and thermal transport in nanostructures. This allows lay the foundation for our understanding of the influence of reduced dimensionality on the fundamental thermal and electrical properties of materials. Her work has provided a series of seminal contributions to the science of carbon based nanos structures for five decades. Besides being dubbed the queen of carbon by her peers, Dresselhaus has also been a great role model for many young students in the field. Please, Dresselhaus. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. And it was just wonderful listening to astronomy and all this big expanse. And what I'm going to talk about today is just the opposite. Instead of all the big things, all the tiny, teeny things. So well, here's me 50 years ago. So here we see a scale. and. Uh, the universe is somewhere up here, very, very <laughs> far away. <laughs> that was the last talk. And uh, this starts at a centimeter. So that, that's pretty small, but we could see it and we're familiar with it. And what I'm going to talk about is sort of down in this regime. Many, many orders of magnitude smaller. And so small that it's much smaller than what an optical microscope can see but it is at the size of what could be seen with an electron microscope. So we're out there, and uh, where are we? Here's DNA. DNA is 2.3 nanometers. You know, that's many orders of magnitude less than uh, what we can see. But uh, I'm doing nanostructures for the most part today that are one nanometer. So. Uh, we really get very, very tiny. And there are many things that we can discover, just like astronomy uses spectroscopy. We study this also with light, although for us, the wavelength of light is very long compared to what we're looking for. But we can actually get information about it through spectroscopy, and I'll be talking about that. So um, my prize came for studying phonons. So phonons are the vibrations of the atoms in matter. And uh, we have electrons. And we use electrons also to help us to interact with the light. And then the light comes in, interacts with the electrons. And that stirs up the vibrations in the matter that we're looking at. and we investigate these changes in the vibrations. So uh, that's sort of the picture. We have lots of little particles, electrons, phonons, and the photons that are the probes. And a photon, of course, is a bit of electromagnetic energy. So what are we studying with this? Nanostructures, because that's what my prize is about. So <laughs> <laughs> there we go. And uh, so. Uh, what, what, why do we do this? Nanostructures behave differently than the ex exactly the same material in bulk form. And we'd like to know what the difference between the behavior is between the nanostructures and the behavior in the bulk form. So that's one of the objectives. And uh, by studying the scattering of light from those objects, so it's a little bit like astronomy because they're studying scattering of something from something else, right? We have collisions and whatnot. We study something not, not so different. And uh, what happens is that in many of the things that we study, uh, there is interactions that in the, these little bits of matter 
that we can see in nanostructures that we don't see in 3D bulk materials. So that's what the objective of our work is, and we study many things, and I focus on just two topics for my talk today, carbon and energy. So I try to do all of this in the remaining uh, part of my 25 minutes. So uh, I started out inspired, this is 50 years ago when I started all this. Uh, so I, I was ex uh, very much inspired by a paper that's even l older than 50, minutes, 50 years ago, and that's 1947, uh, where it was shown that carbon is different from everything else. And that work inspired me to study something that was different from everything else, and that's why I got into carbon. And so the first part of the talk, which is the major part, is about this thing that's different for everything else. Now, I thought that the solar system and, and out there in space, uh, we would hear something about carbon being different out in space. It probably is, but I didn't hear about that. So maybe you should look for that, and we could <laughs> talk about that in the future. So, and what's different about carbon is that the electrons in these carbon formations behave very differently. In all other kind of semiconductors, normal material, uh, the uh, dispersion relations, that, the, that means that the relation between energy and momentum of the object is quadratic. That's for other things. But for carbon, the relation is linear. So why is that? Well, it has to do with symmetry. But I'm not going to go into that aspect today, because that's a, a lecture all in itself. But I'm going to talk about the consequences of that on carbon. Uh, so my study spanned 50 years, so I started here in 1960. And that's uh, when I first started working at MIT. I got my first job. Uh, as independent researcher. Back in 1960, what happened uh, in the world is we had Sputnik. And uh, Sputnik came from the Russians. And the Western world was very excited about the Russians having the capability of working in space. So that, that has to do something with the astro community. Uh, uh, they inspired this. So it's also related to the first set of talks, isn't it? Uh, but uh, we didn't have that in the U.S. And Western Europe, I don't think Norway had that either at the time. So we're all in this together. So uh, we started uh, looking at that, ti that time to see what was so special about carbon. And that, that inspired me to get in into this back in 1960. So the first 10 years, I worked on bulk graphite. Because believe it or not, at that time, we didn't even understand the mother material, not the nanoform. So the first 10 years was, were devoted to that. And then in 1973, I started working on intercalation compounds. I'll tell you what that is and why it's interesting. So that's a one-dimensional system, having two-dimensional layers. So we have stacks of things. So that's the one dimension that we have stacks. And then the two-dimensionality is what happens in the stacks. So uh, that's um, the intercalation compound. And then in 1980, just around in here, we started discovering clusters. So that's this blue thing. Uh, and uh, that led to fullerenes, which is this big hump, 1980s. Five fullerenes were discovered, and we discovered precursors of fullerenes in 1984. But we didn't know what they were. So uh, uh, that, that's the fullerene hump. And then in 1992, uh, two of our, our collaborators, Fujita san, who is not alive anymore, but Saito san uh, is, and he's in the audience, and they predicted that. Uh, what the nanotubes might be like if we could see them, discover them. So we started working on that project. Uh, so here, here's nanotubes. And then we had graphene at the very end, 2004. Well, 
we started working crafting actually in the very beginning from the 1947 work and it was the inspiration all along here and the first paper we wrote was on graphene was in 1996. So somehow or other, we got into all of these things ahead of time, but m some of the time we didn't ex uh, use the vocabulary that's used today. So you don't know that they're connected, but that's what happened historically. So that ex sort of explains uh, the big picture of what we've done. Uh, now I'll go through each topic uh, quickly and try to tell you what we found and why it's important. So here in intercalation compounds, so the inspiration of this is that we have a material that just one layer uh, in thickness. Uh, we wanted to look at one layer, but we didn't know how, because at that time, uh, what we did uh, before looking at graphite is we made beautiful surface so we could do optical studies. And we used scotch tape just like the people in, in graphene do today, but we threw away the single layers. <laughs> we didn't have an idea that we could peel them off and do interesting science. Just threw them away and looked at the bulk. So that was the first mistake we made. <laughs> and, uh, but then we uh, did look at these layers when they were embedded in something else. And for a period of about 15 years, we found all kinds of properties, electronic, what the vibrations do, superconductivity in these materials, all kinds of things like that we studied during that period. So it was a kind of interesting time, and we educated many students in these various areas. So uh, it's very nice to work in a field where you can branch out to the whole field of condensed matter, and intercalation was something like that. So I enjoyed that aspect very much. <coughs> At the, uh, we had some conferences in this field. Every time we had a conference in these early years, and uh, this may be one of the very first uh, fields that had international conferences in condensed matter. And uh, so in 1977, we had the first conference on intercalation compounds, and that brought the field together and produced a big increase in population in the field. Every time we had, in those years, an international conference, what followed that was a big increase in population of, of researchers. So a second conference was in, in 1980, and it produced uh, 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 looking at carbon fibers. And carbon fibers um, was a, pr a precursor of carbon nanotubes. So it just had more layers. Uh, so I was out here in 1990 with uh, carbon fibers, and going down in this direction, you can make the carbon fibers smaller and smaller, and if it just has one layer, then we get a single-walled nanotube. So that was an idea that we had in our minds, but we didn't think we could ever make that. And uh, then in 1985, Smalley discovered this object, and so we were studying spectroscopy of this object, so infrared and Raman spectroscopy, you heard that in the last talk. We had infrared spec spectra studying the, the heavens above us, but we were doing uh, little tiny nanostructures with IR and Raman spectroscopy. And so just imagine that we go from C60 to C70 by elongating along this axis. So you heard about ellipsoidal planets out there. We have something like that, so that's C80. And then you extend that some more, that's C100, and eventually you get something like that. So that's the connection between fullerenes and nanotubes. So we have this in our minds, sort of, and um, then in 1991, um, having talked to various people, I mentioned this at a conference, and as soon as I I did that, I saw old people pulling out their notebooks and started writing down what I was saying. So I said, well, maybe this is interesting. Maybe we should look <laughs> into this. 
And that fall, so this is about two months later, I had two visitors, uh, Fujita-san and Saito-san. They were young faculty members in Japan. And uh, there's something about MIT that attracts young people in their early careers. And so these two gentlemen came as very young faculty members, and they were looking around for somebody to work with, and they sort of selected me somehow. And so, uh, and I suggested that they say, if we could uh, really make a nanotube, what would its properties be like? And they wrote a, a very interesting paper that suggested the following concept. So you know that if you take uh, a single sheet of uh, carbon atoms, we call that graphene nowadays. And you know, because you've probably heard in some seminar somewhere, that, it, that the uh, band structure of graphene has this linear uh, E versus K relation I mentioned in my first view graph. So here's linear E versus K. It's a cone, right? E linear relation uh, on the surface here. Uh, but now we have, we're rolling this up to make a little uh, cylinder. So instead of having an infinite number of atoms along here, we have only maybe 10 carbon atoms. So we have to have only 10 uh, quantum states. So when we have few quantum states, those are those big lines. There are the heavy lines. Uh, that means that the uh, allowed uh, states for the electrons will be quantized. So we have a system something like this. And then we can make transitions between these. And if these uh, lines happen to go through this vertex, then we have a continuum of states. So that would be metallic. Otherwise, we have a semiconductor. So that was the idea of uh, Fujita and, and Saito Sensei. And then we started doing experiments and found that to actually be true. So that was the uh, uh, experiment. The technique that we have used in our laboratory rather extensively for a long time is infrared, which you heard about, and Raman spectroscopy. And I won't show you many uh, details here or even results. But the bottom line is we could take spectra, and this is a sort of a typical spectrum that you see. And this is a carbon-carbon uh, vibration. That's first order. And here is the second order. It's very, very strange, this material. What linear E versus K allows you to do is to have higher order phenomena bigger than the fundamental. And you can understand that because through resonance. We heard from the astronomers that resonance changes how we, all the data. So you have data that's different and you wonder how this happens. W with resonance, you can get a very large signal from a rather small object. And that's what we're doing here because every single transition is resonant. And because of that, the initial state is resonant and the final state is resonant. Everything in between is resonant. And that's what's responsible for these very huge peaks. So uh, just like in the first talk, we find that resonance leads to phenomena that are unusual. And by interpreting that, we learn many things about what happens about the electrons, about the vibrations, and the interaction between them. Now, so without going into very much detail, I'm just going to show you a couple of spectra. Uh, this is the a very um, well-known, and I saw the author of this, first author of this paper, uh, A.M. Rao, is in, in the room. And uh, this is a paper of 1997, very frequently quoted paper, because it shows us two things. It shows us that if you have a nanotube, this is done on nanotubes. If you take a nanotube, this is a bundle of nanotubes. There are many nanotubes in here. Each one of them has some resonant frequency where all the atoms in the periphery are vib vibrating in the radial direction and it's a resonance, so it gives you a very large effect when the laser frequency is equal to the energy separation between the initial and final states. So that's how we get for selected uh, uh, 
photon energies, we select which phonon we're looking at, and that produces what we have here. So that's the origin explanation of this. And uh, because it's very specific to a specific uh, nanotube, we can measure the diameter of the nanotube. So this became uh, the first way that we had of accurately measuring the diameter of a nano object, approximately one nanometer in size, to rather high accuracy, three places, which is pretty good for something that small, done with a probe that's the wavelength of light, much huge size. Okay, so that, that's the idea of this. And this one here is the allowed transition between two adjacent uh, carbon atoms that are just vibrating this way, breathing mode. Okay, so, and we learn a lot of information about this, about the electrons and the interaction between one electron and another, and the whole sea of electrons, because in a, a solid state system, we have huge number of, of, of electrons. So, Avogadro's kind of number of electrons and they're interacting with each other. We get information about the many body effects of that sort of thing. Now, since the process here, if you look, you'll find that these lines look very different, and they change in their appearance as we change the photon energy. The signal is very large. That told us that we had a resonance phenomenon and gave us the idea that we should perhaps try to look for individual nanotubes, because if we could get uh, that kind of information, we could then uh, be, be able to identify which nanotube we had. And uh, so here you could see some spectra. This is radial breathing mode. That gives the diameter. And the shape of the spectrum, like, for example, uh, here you see the, the carbon-carbon vibrations very different here and there. This particular kind of very large intensity and sharp vibration has to do with the, with the semiconducting tubes, and these ones have to do with the metallic tubes that are uh, uh, totally different because they're damped. We have the interaction between these atoms. So uh, what happened after that? So uh, I, I, I was talking about nanotubes. Uh, in this period, we uh, started working um, with many other things. So here, here is graphene. I'm not going to tell you very much about what we did. This is what other people did. Uh, what our contribution was is looking at ribbons. So Ribbons are like nanotubes that are opened up. So if you understand nanotubes, you can do ribbons. And we use the correspondence between nanotubes and ribbons to learn many things about graphene. So I won't go into the details of that, but that's the whole story about the big, big thing about this that was interesting is a paper that we wrote in 1996 about graphene. And um, so, what this told us is if we had these ribbons, the edges would have a very high density of electron states because every time that the shape of the ribbon had these zigzags at the end, uh, that would give this high density of states. And this is the prediction that was made. And then we did experiments that showed that was correct. But the armchairs could be like nanotubes. They could either uh, be metallic or semiconducting, and that was also verified experimentally. So that's a little bit about the ribbons, and we see beautiful images. This is not spectroscopy, but this is microscopy in, a, in an electron microscope, where we, in the side of the electron microscope, we do both transport and we do spectroscopy on the same object at the same time but I won't say much more. i just conclude by telling you another part of nanostructures that we were working on that was cited um, by the Kavli Foundation, and this is applications to energy. So uh, people were concerned 
about energy conversion. And just the same year that we discovered about semiconducting and metallic nanotubes, um, I got um, a call from the Defense Department and uh, et cetera, that they needed somebody to think about uh, energy conversion between waste heat and electricity. And since uh, MIT is a place that does interdisciplinary work, they thought I might be able to come, come and help them with that. And that led to this other aspect of my nano studies that was cited by the Kavli Foundation. And so you see that the solar spectrum has this red part, and uh, that is amenable to solar cells. So lots of people study this, but the sun also gives us all of this heat energy. And this is sort of like waste heat out there. And so what can we do with that? And that's thermoelectricity, which is the next few graphs. Oh, well, this tells you that the world needs energy because we have a few parts of the world. You know, uh, this is where I live here in the US. <laughs> we use a lot of energy, much too much. But uh, here is Europe. And uh, you can see, well, here's Scandinavia. Uh, Norway's pretty uh, well settled, especially along the coast. You see, they use quite some energy, but not as inland, not so much. Uh, uh, and th then when you get into Europe, well, they use plenty of energy. Here's Japan somewhere. They're also all lit up. So you can see what's happening in the world uh, this way. But um, what, what we've been studying is this conversion between waste energy. So uh, if you have a temperature difference between something, two uh, sides of a bar, so the electron distribution will be different. So uh, uh, here, you're at high energy, uh, the high temperature, so you'll have more electrons, and then we have low, low uh, uh, temperature. So uh, that will have less. So you have different amounts of uh, uh, charge. And uh, because of that, there's a voltage difference. And um, uh, that's generated. Uh, by the temperature difference in the bar. And that's called the Zabeck uh, coefficient. Uh, that, that is related then to, well, we have bar, we have electrical conductivity, and then we have to maintain the temperature difference, so we have thermal uh, conductivity as well. And this is the factor uh, that we um, have. So uh, if we take the quotient of this, we get something that's dimensionless, and that dimensionless factor turns out to be approximately one for the best thermoelectric materials that could be made for up till about 1990 when we started on this, and the Defense Department wanted to improve this, so they got in touch with me and probably a few other people, um, and we started working on this. And so uh, S, that's the Zabeck coefficient over here, uh, decreases, you could see, as the carrier concentration increases, the electrical conductivity increases. So you don't have a possibility in the same material of maximizing this quantity because they, they're counter-indicated. And when the electrical conductivity goes up, the thermal conductivity also goes up because of wiedemann franz law. And so those uh, uh, changes c almost cancel one another. So because of this, it's very hard to change the value of ZT. So people were working on this problem for about 30 years, not very hard because they gave up. But we got started in this at, in 1990. And the idea was that we would use nano because nano has different properties than non-nano. And uh, maybe that would make a big difference. And it turned out to make quite a large difference. And for the last 20 years, that's what people have been doing, including us. We sort of started working on that. And um, so I can show you what's happened. Uh, this is many people and many uh, results. 
And you could see that the original prediction that we made in 1992 that nano would be helpful and why is really does work. So you take silicon germanium, this is bulk and then, then this is nano. And then take, so this is the two red ones. And here we start with um, uh, one is n-type, one is p-type. You get the same thing for that. And all of these things are nano, and we go way above this ZT of one. So the prediction, this is to show you that the prediction works. And this view graph shows you how we actually make samples that make this in bulk quantities. What I showed you before is how we do the proof of principle for many materials. Once you know you're on the right track, you try to make a device that actually does something for society and something like this. It's a very messy kind of looking material, but the idea is to make a bulk nano system. So that's what we do. And uh, I think this might be a good place to end. When you do that, every single property improves. We showed before that if you had a bulk object, bulk, bulk system, when something goes up, the other thing goes down. But if you have it nano, they can all go in the right direction if you prepare the sample properly. So uh, nano really does a lot of things. But when we started out this, uh, and you go to a, 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 a conference on nano properties, you often hear that nano is very good, it, it will save the world. But you don't really hear too many details. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> because it's really hard to do it in, in practice. And, but what's happened in, in the last 20 years or so is we've learned a lot on how to do it, and, but it's hard work in each case. Uh, this is thermoelectrics, and you could just take some other field where nano has had an impact. It's not easy to get from the concept in the beginning to the actual practice. Uh, but this is an example of a uh, uh, situation, same sample, electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity, ZB coefficient, and finally ZT. And you can see that ZT goes up, up over the whole temperature range, uh, whereas uh, if you had in bulk form, it wouldn't do the same. What we're working on now, this is my very final comment, is that... Uh, before, I just, I just showed for the same sample what you can do. But what I'm showing here is that we have shown that nano really works. What can we do now that uh, is different? And uh, so we have four different uh, categories of improvements that have been done in the last just couple of years. So a field moves up to a certain point, and then we reach sort of a hiatus, and everybody sort of catches up, and then new ideas come. Because uh, science always works like this, that uh, uh, somebody finds something that's uh, promising, and many people join the bandwagon, and they do many different kinds of experiments, but they're similar. And they show the proof of principle, and then they show the actual demonstration. And then what we do after that is uh, we say, OK, if we know how to do this, we can do more things. And these are the more things that, that have happened. So uh, we found that you can make resonance states. So this goes back, we heard in the first talk about resonance states in astronomy. And then I told you about resonance states in carbon systems. We have them here. And they're also very promising because that allows you to change uh, thermoelectricity as well. And um, then we can control density of states. That's a it's something we do in, in condensed matter physics all the time. We try to figure out a way to control this, and you can do it with thermoelectrics, actually, beneficially. And um, finally, um, we have another way of making um, a system where you can have, sort of have your cake and eat it, too, is you make conduction paths where you have high mobility by controlling where the phonons are and where the electrons will be. You don't have them concentrated in equilibrium, but we have them in semi-equilibrium by putting 
of boundaries between those two systems. And as long as we don't heat the temperature above the, where the phase transition makes them join, we can maintain those two, two pathways and uh, control properties as we would like. So um, there are many promising things in, in, in the energy field, this is a, a field just beginning to open up and many opportunities for young people, not thermal electricity in particular, but other kinds of ener energy harvesting. And I suppose in Norway, this is, could be something interesting, uh, especially in wintertime, you think about uh, <laughs> um, getting some wind energy, whatever, we can go from one form to another, uh, I think might be very interesting. So I'll end with that.